Well, in Genesis 6, the sons of God came into the daughters of men, took wives, and it's a very simple statement. Mm -hmm. Not much to it. No details. But right. it raises a multitude of questions. Mm -hmm. And in a way, that's what your book is all about, right? That's right. Yeah. So the first half of the book is all about who are those sons of God, because that is a debated topic within the church. And then the second half is who are the Nephilim. Uh, okay. Who are those sons of God? Now, that's that's a huge question. It is. And I'm thinking of a lot of TV I've seen lately speculating on ancient peoples mm. and, and ancient mythology and uh, linking it to some, maybe some of the UFO appearances and saying they're back. Those same angels that used to fall down or have come down on planet Earth have, are now coming down in their UFOs. And you hear all kinds and every kind of mixture you can think of on this subject lately. But, uh, of course, what we want is the truth as expressed in the Bible. Right. And so that was my goal is to filter out a lot of that noise that of all of the modern speculation, modern sensationalism, if you will. It doesn't mean that all of that is necessarily wrong, but let's just look at what does the Bible actually tell us. Yeah, well, give it a go here. Yeah. Let's, where would you start? Well, first, we've got to identify who the sons of God are, who are the daughters of men. And when you look at that, that terminology, um, it tells us when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, and they took wives from whomever they chose. So the sons of God, that's the first time that word that that wording appears in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And there are three primary views that, that Christians have held for the last 2,000 years. One is uh, the earliest view that we know of is that they were angelic beings who rebelled against God, married women, and had children by them. And most people who hold that view would say that the Nephilim, the giants, were the children from the, those unions. Um, that was the earliest Christian view, is the earliest Jewish view as far as we know. And then around the beginning of the second century, another view came about from uh, from some Jewish rabbis, and it was the what we call the royalty view or the divine king's view. These were kings who viewed themselves as divine or there were judges who viewed themselves as divine and their, their children, the sons of those divine beings, uh, the, the people who viewed themselves as divine, uh, they the sons were taking wives into their harems. And so the sin there would be like polygamy, and that's why mm -hmm. uh, they were judged for that. Um, the It doesn't really explain why they would have giant offspring. Uh, there, there are a lot of other problems yeah. with that as well. Uh, but the third view, and the one that's been dominant in church history from about the time of Augustine, so late 4th century, early 5th century, up until about the last 100 years, is that the sons of God were actually men from the line of Adam to Noah through uh, Adam's son, Seth. So they hmm. call this the Sethite view. Mm -hmm. And then the okay. daughters of men were the women in the line of Cain. And so what the sin there was, according to this view, is that the the sons of God, the descendants of the son of, uh, the descendants of Seth, were marrying, intermarrying, see a believer marrying unbelievers, what the, the view says. And uh, so that was the, the problem. So those are the three major views. And uh, so what I do in the book is I lay out each case and I say, here's the arguments for each one. Here's the arguments against it. And I think the first one I mentioned, the fallen angel view, is the only one that holds up to any scrutiny. And the, the dominant portion of the book is devoted to explaining that, the yes. angelic view, right? That's right. So I, I spend several chapters. I think there are four chapters that deal with the arguments for that position. Uh, from Scripture, both Old Testament, New Testament, also church history. And then there are five chapters dealing with the objections to that view, because I, I want to make sure everybody's objections are heard. I've heard a lot of them, and if people read the book, they're probably going to think, I've never even heard of that one before, but I'm glad he included it because I'm wondering how he would explain it. Um, but the other ones, I think, have fatal flaws. So the, the Sethite view and the royalty view, uh, I think the, the text rules them out pretty easily. And I think a lot of times the reason people adopt those is they're uncomfortable with the fallen angel view. It's not because of what the text does or doesn't say. It's the more of a gut feeling reaction to it, that they, they don't like it. Well, you have mighty men of old in, in the the King James Version. The mm -hmm. uh, What came out of, of this these unions 
with sons of God are called mighty men of old, men of renown. Who, who are those mighty men and who are those men of renown? Yeah, so the beginning of verse 4 says the Nephilim or the giants. That The word Nephilim just means giants. People will try to say, oh, it means fallen ones. No, it doesn't. And I, I go through that in the book. It, it doesn't mean fallen you ones. You do spend a lot of time on that question. By the way, what does that, uh, we call it Nephilim mm -hmm. uh, from Nafal, well, the people people will argue that it's from Nafal, uh -huh. that, but it's not. But it's not. It's not. And and I remember that you spent a lot of time on that question. Yeah, bec because it it destroys a lot of the other arguments. People will will base their entire idea. But on that's this. what I hear all the time. It's, but it's uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, it's you know, all over the internet. It's on podcasts. It's all over. But you know where you won't find it? Where? Hebrew English lexicons. Ah. You won't find it in academic commentaries. Wow. You won't find scholars saying it. You'll find pop theology saying it. And it's, okay. not that, it's not that they're always wrong, but if the linguistic scholars are saying, no, it doesn't mean that, and the academic, uh, the people who make a living and, and study this their whole career are saying it doesn't mean that. Uh, but the language itself shows that it can't be from the verb nafal, because if you wanted to turn that into a participle, which is okay. you're going to be using this verb as a noun. Um, it either be, because the way the Hebrew language works, it, the, it morphs uh, the, the morphology. So the, the letters change, the vowels change a little bit. It becomes nophilim or nephulim with a U. It does not become nephilim. So the word nephilim is actually from an Aramaic noun, nafil. And when you make that plural in Aramaic, it's nephilim. So it, naf nafil rather than nafal. Right. And nafil just means giant. And okay. So nephilim is plural of giant. It means plural, giants. Plural of giants. Okay. Yeah. So that kind of puts us on course here to yes. begin the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's who those mighty men were because it tells us the, the nephilim, the giants were on the earth in those days. Now remember Moses is writing this. Yeah. So he says in those days, talking about before the flood and also afterwards. So before the flood and after the flood, whenever the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bore children to them. These are the mighty men of old men every now. So the right. offspring of those unions were giants. Now Moses was in a really good position to, to know that history. Yes. Having grown up in Egypt as part of a very important family in Egypt and, 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 and a, himself uh, a notary, a personality. I, this, the, he was very well known, very mm -hmm. well respected, apparently. I've, I've read from secular history, history that Moses actually was a, a general in the Egyptian army and, and was, is credited with having fought a battle hmm. and won. And he was called a, a hero in battle. And you don't read that in the Bible, but you do find it in, in little tidbits of history here and there, uh, whether true or not. That we can discuss that, but the point is Moses is writing from that perspective, and you, you sort of have to listen to him when he puts these things down. Right. So Moses is, if you think about when he's writing this, it's during the probably during the wilderness wandering. So it is. Yes, he spent forty days on Mount Sinai with the Lord, and that's where you get Exodus twenty and and some of the law. But then a lot of Genesis and some of the other books are being written during that wilderness wandering that forty years. And they sent the spies into the land before that, yes. and they're, they're supposed to spy it out. And uh, they come back talking about giants, talking about Nephilim in the land. And so Moses is talking about, here's how these people got here. Uh, let me take you back to Genesis chapter, I'll tell you what happened before the flood. By the way, they were here before, they're also here after. And how did it happen? Well, it's whenever the sons of God did this activity, that's how you get the Nephilim on the earth. And so he he gives us that. The other thing that it happens in that same context, and we often skip over verse 3 of Genesis 6, where it talks about, the Lord said, my spirit will not strive with man or dwell in man forever, for he is indeed flesh, and his days shall be 120 years. Moses, think about where that this passage is positioned. It's right after Genesis 5, where Adam lives 930 years and he died. Seth lives 912 years and he died. Skip down a little ways. Methuselah, 969 years and he died. And all of these guys are over 900 years old. If you're an Israelite wandering in the wilderness and hearing that for the first time, what question are you asking? How come we don't live so long? How come these guys used to live over 900 years? Mm -hmm. And then right after that, you get this passage, the sons of God and the Nephilim. And in verse three, God says, your days are gonna be 120. And what you see from that point on is a drop. You have Noah living 950 years, next generation is 600, then it's into the 400s, all the way down to Moses who lives 120 years. 
And since Moses, how many people have lived 120 years? Just Jehoiada the priest, 130 years. Other than that, nobody reaches that. True. And, and so I think it was God's way of saying, look, I let you live. A, you're supposed to live forever, but you ate the fruit, you're going to die. And now you're not going to live more than a thousand years. At least that's what we see in Genesis 5. So he reduced their lifespans. And then look how wicked people become if you, we let them live 900 years. So now to curb that wickedness, you're dropping down to 120. And I, that's what we see. Um, so I, I think that this topic explains that as well. So Moses writes about the mighty men <clears throat> which were of old. Mm -hmm. And uh, and of course, Moses himself uh, is a uh, a landmark figure, and uh, he was he was hated but respected. And I remember, you know, when, when you read uh, about Moses in secular history or in, in Greco-Roman histories, a touch on Moses occasionally with, and say things that uh, did that really happen or not? <clears throat> but he was a legendary figure. Mm -hmm. uh, I think even to people scattered around the world at his time, the powerful, powerful man. So when he makes this statement, and he's talking about mighty men which were of old men of renown, he is pointing you to something for a reason here. And that something is still being debated very assiduously. Yeah, it, it could be a reference to, you know, you look at Greek, Greco-Roman history, you look at the, the Greek gods on Olympus and the, you know, the Romans kind of had the same gods, just gave them different names. Uh, but you got Norse mythology and all sorts of different mythologies that right. have the, the gods coming down and having affairs with women and producing demigods, mighty men, uh, like Hercules and Theseus and, and some of these other ones. Um, uh, even the Amazons, according to some tradition, like the, the women who were, dem some of them have them as demigods. And so you have these mighty beings that are, that are talked about in these different cultures. And I think what those are, uh, I call them echoes of reality, echoes of history. So that it's like the, uh, mankind had a shared history up till Babel, you know, up in Genesis mm -hmm. chapter 11. <clears throat> they had the same, they got off the ark and that, those people, rather than scattering like they're supposed to, they went to the plain of Shinar and they're building the city in a tower. And so they had a, the same history at that point. But then when they scatter, they start to pass that history down generation after generation and it gets distorted it over does, the years. Yeah. But that kernel of truth is still there. So you have a whole bunch of things from Genesis 1 through 11 that these ancient cultures share, even though they're distorted in many ways. So the creation of man from the dust of the ground, man being man dies or becomes sinful because of something to do with the tree and or a serpent uh, a worldwide flood is all over the place that's hundreds of those legends have that even babel legends we've found about 23 of those uh, but the other thing that occurs in a lot of them is the gods coming down and mating with women and producing giants or demigods and so i think what we see there yeah. is echoes of the real history which is recorded for us in in genesis 